to the new IT Girls Meetup. I'm super happy that you're here and I'm really happy that we um, do it in English this time to also um, get more people into it and be more inclusive. Um, my name is Astrid. Um, I'm co-founder of the new IT Girls together with um, Doares, who has the same nice background as I do, so you can recognize her. <laughs> um, so what will happen today? Um, we um, have our um, sponsor of the event, um, Trigo, with us, um, who is our event sponsor of the virtual meetup for today. And I will quickly go through the vision of the new IT girls, why we founded the network um, together um, approximately one year ago. Then we will have our sponsor Trigo uh, introducing themselves and telling us more about what they do and why they were eager to support the new IT girls as well. And then we will have Antje talking about um, gender diversity in software development. So I'm really looking forward to it. Um, just really short, um, who are the new IT girls and why did we found the new IT girls? So basically Doris and I are in IT since um, quite some time and many times at events, at meetings with customers or partners, at panel discussions, there are always just men and we were very often the only two female participants at these events. So we thought, OK, how come that there are no other women and where are all the other women in IT? And uh, that's why we actually created the new IT Girls. So our vision is really to connect women in IT in Austria and beyond the borders um, without binding it to any job titles. So we really want to um, have people from sales, from software development, HR, marketing, whoever is interested in IT, is working in IT, um, or uh, wants to follow a career in IT. And the reason behind that is that so many times, especially women are discouraged um, in uh, following a career in IT because they're very or they have the impression that there are, there are little other women um, in IT. And with the new IT girls, we really want to form a platform that connects us all together um, so that we can exchange, encourage each other, and also encourage more women to follow a career in tech. Um, just quickly before we start, um, the community is really from formed by each of one of you. So it's not Doris and I who are having this community and you're invited. It's really a community. So we want you to participate and actually um, maybe have an introductory talk, just like Antje will um, talk about software development and gender equality. We are always looking for new IT girls who want to share a topic that you're passionate about, something that you learn in your job, some tools that you're using, some nice experience that you made, whatever you think could be interesting and where you learned from and want to share with us. Please feel free to just um, um, connect with us either directly or you can go to the link that is on the screen and just enter your topic that you could think of and we would come back to you. Also, if you want to be one of our next event sponsors, um, we would be very happy to have you. Just send us an email and we will also connect with you. Um, how can you follow us um, besides our meetups? Um, I think meetup everyone found because you're here. Um, but we also have a LinkedIn page and are on Instagram. So we would be happy to connect there as well. In our LinkedIn group, it's a closed group. So we really want to use this space to exchange, share ideas and so on um, while not having the meetups. And obviously the meetups are our points of connection where we really want to have a discussion and conversation together with you. All right, um, I know that we cannot see each other physically, but I would still love to have a community photo. 
So whoever feels like, I would love for you to turn on the camera and I would take a screenshot so that we have a kind of group photo, even though it's just virtually, but it would be really, really cool. Oh, and I see people outside. Wow, what a nice weather. Hi, people. <laughs> so cool. <laughs> I just have to wait so that all the videos pop up with me and then I can do a screenshot. Or can you do it, Doris? Mine is so slow. No, no, it's because you are also in a preview, so you see more pictures than I do. I always and I have to do it. Yeah, you have to do it, sorry. All right, <laughs> then um, say cheese. <laughs> Oh wait, now Salah turned on and uh, now cheese. <laughs> it always looks really stupid. I like it. Uh, <laughs> I will take another one. I just have to save it really quick um, so that we don't lose it. And I will take one more just to be sure because we have a new feature um, the together mode which is even um, newer than just the gallery so we'll try out this one as well to have us all sit together and one more time cheese <laughs> amazing 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 will you share the results with us uh, wait, you have to smile one more time. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> you have to smile more. <laughs> like to that. And don't oh, move. Oh. Don't move. <laughs> I will keep it that way. It looks really fun. All right. Um, but without taking any more time for the most important part. No, just kidding. Um, I would like to actually hand over uh, to our uh, event sponsor and especially to Wolfgang, who is developer at Trigo and who will share uh, more about the company, what they're doing and how, what they are thinking about um, maybe also gender diversity in software development. Hi, thank you. Let me just uh, share my screen. Okay, can you see the slide? It's loading. For me, it's loading as well. Yeah, I see the slides. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, now I can see it as well. Great. Okay. Hopefully the rest too. So, hi, I'm Wolfgang from Trigo. I'm a full stack developer with a strong focus on front end development, and I'm working at Trigo since 2017. Yeah, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for the opportunity to introduce our company to you. Uh, we believe that gender diversity is an important thing. Uh, the industry needs to change and needs to create equal rights to everyone. More gender diversity, not only in software development, can bring new perspectives and can help in understanding the customer needs in a better way. We start with ourselves to move the industry and the community towards that direction. And as a company, we have the responsibility to give something back to the community. And that's why we are here to sponsor this meetup. Okay, so here are just some uh, quick facts about uh, Trigo. Trigo was founded in 2011 by Markus, David and Christian. It is an owner managed company with currently 14 employees. Here you can see a list of some of our clients. There are small and medium-sized enterprises, as well as larger corporations from the semi-public sector. And this is our team. So how is it to work at Trigo? Um, as the COVID pandemic started, we were forced to switch to a remote workflow, but this worked out surprisingly well for us. We have tried a variety of tools to improve our remote communication and came up with a set of tools that works great for us. A really good thing about our remote first workflow is that a lot of us can save plenty of time coming to the office and spend more time with their families. It has also improved our communication. We started to discuss technical and non-technical topics on discourse. 
And this comes with the positive side effect that all discussions and decisions from it were documented right away. Every team member now has the opportunity to participate in the topics they are interested in, no matter when or from where they work. And new team members can follow the decision process much better. We decided to keep this remote first workflow and benefit from all the positive aspects that come with it. Everyone is free to come to the office if they prefer that, but can also stay at home and work from there. In the end, it is about you and that you can stay focused and productive. So you might think that uh, all of this flexibility is great, but how about extroverts and uh, the need to socialize? Well, we keep regularly team events, game nights and uh, Dungeons and Dragons sessions where you can get in touch with team members that you maybe don't work with every day. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the technology we use. For the DevOps part, we use Docker to containerize our applications and services, and we deploy them on a Kubernetes cluster. And we use Jenkins for continuous integration and continuous delivery. In the backend, we store our data mostly in Postgres databases, but we also have uh, Elasticsearch or MongoDB where the requirements are for it. Our business services are written in TypeScript and use best practices from domain-driven design and a hexagonal architecture. These services expose interfaces via gRPC for performant inter-service communication and REST and GraphQL interfaces for clients or third-party services. On the front end, we write our web applications in TypeScript and React. For the styling, we use Tailwind CSS and styled components. We are also creating our own design system with a strong focus on accessibility and best practices in designing UX. This allows us to iterate fast on user stories and at the same time deliver neat user interfaces. Okay, so surprise, we are hiring. Our vacancies at the moment are a front-end developer and UX designer. So please contact us at office at trigo.dev if you're interested. And also if you're interested in working for us, but these vacancies doesn't suit you, you can get in touch with us anyway. All right, uh, that's from my part. Now I'm looking forward to the upcoming talk and thank you. Cool, thank you so much Wolfgang for the introduction. Um, really interested to interesting to learn more about Trigo as well and which technologies you're using. Um, I like the Dungeon and Dragons part because I just posted um, actually now a LinkedIn group about a um, uh, uh, picture I found online about Dungeon and Dragons. So good to know that you're also playing it. <laughs> um, and <laughs> I would really like to hand over now to our speaker of today, um, Antje, who will share um, more about uh, gender diversity in software development. And um, I really liked um, actually the title of, um, of the talk, Demystification of Coding. I really like that. Sounds really cool. I'm really interested in what you're going to share with us and about the discussion afterwards. Thank you so much. Thank you, Astrid and uh, Doris, uh, for the invitation to speak today and for setting up the group, obviously. Also, big thanks to Trigo for supporting um, the community, for supporting the mission. Um, we do have some nice developers for you, just to let you know. <laughs> we have a matching tech stack. <laughs> so, so there's already some benefit in, co in, in having this networking here. <laughs> But but yeah, I, um, uh, we can we can discuss that later. Uh, so yeah, um, I will just no unterhaltung ausblenden. It's not what I want. I want to share my screen. Let me show you. Aha, demystification. Now I can't see myself anymore, which is nice because that that, that distracts me. So the the worst part about re being remote is that I can see myself all the time when talking. <laughs> so so let me know if, if you can't see me anymore because I'm doing weird things or standing up, let me know. Otherwise, I will just keep on talking and, and uh, you have to raise your hands because right now in this full screen mode, I can only see my slide. 
So I haven't worked with teams uh, so much before. So so I said you need to kind of poke me digitally if something's <laughs> wrong or if somebody can't hear me or see anything. Did uh, you already share the screen? Um, is it just me not seeing it? It should be visible. I'm sharing it. Do it's full it. screen for me. What about the others? I can see it, but I it's can not see in it. presentation mode. It's the slide, but not a slideshow. The slide, but not the slideshow. I'm already in presentation mode. That's good, right? Like you see one page. No, we see no. Um, uh, uh, um, no. PowerPoint. Yeah, PowerPoint. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How about that? Is that better? No. no. Maybe you have to share the the uh, second screen or so. Maybe. Let me or, or try again if you click on it. Trying again. Ah. Better. Yeah. yeah better. Perfect. And now you can also um, put us away because at least I see a small gray box. I don't know about the others. Yeah. Now it's perfect. That was you. <laughs> I, cl I clicked you away. <laughs> the small box was me. Uh -oh. Yes, yes. It was like delete Astrid. Okay. <laughs> nice. Okay. Sorry for for taking a bit long in the setup. Welcome everybody. I'm really really happy for anybody joining, um, regardless of gender, obviously. Um, and so really really appreciate um, that you're interested in the topic and um, hope this is going to be fun. I will also start my timer because this is my passion topic and I can talk for ages. I can definitely I can definitely talk for three hours straight about this topic, which is not what you want. Obviously, I will try to keep track of the time and leave some room for discussion, question and after, uh, answers uh, uh, afterwards. So demystification of coding. I wanted a catchy title. I think I uh, delivered. But now I have to live up to my own standards. We have to talk about this uh, at some point in the presentation and we will, I promise. But we will also go through some uh, basics. What is causing gender inequalities in tech? Why we need improvement and why we especially need improvement now, like more than ever and like why it's desperately needed at the moment and um, how we can all contribute to having achieving more gender, gender diversity in tech. Um, I guess all of you will have a lot of feelings about this. There's a ton of different aspects and layers when it comes to this topic. It was really hard for me to um, boil it down to something that could be manageable in uh, in, in this in this meetup. Uh, so bear with me when there are some concepts that I don't go into detail, when there's something that might not be scientifically correct or where there's other aspects to it. That I'm, I'm super aware of the fact that there's more, a lot more to diversity in fact than just the gender. Um, but let's focus on this on this gender topic for now. It's already broad enough and we will touch some other things too. Um, maybe quick introduction about myself. I have this awesome shirt that I'm really proud of. Uh, I'm the co-founder of Upleveled. Upleveled is a coding bootcamp uh, here in Vienna. What we do is we teach people with uh, without a tech background or without a coding background how to become web developers in a very, very immersive program. So it's not only short, but also very intense. Um, and it's designed for people who want to switch careers and who want to um, get into tech. Um, this is not only because we have this skill of shortage on the market, but because my co-founder Carl and me also have this feeling of we need more diverse backgrounds in tech teams. We will actually have a look at that in this uh, in this presentation too. My background is not in tech. I'm also not a software developer, which might be a, a bit surprising regarding the topic. Um, a couple of years ago, I probably would have introduced myself as uh, coming from sales and um, and business development, which is true. Uh, I've been working in sales for 15 years, B2B sales, mainly machine building automotive markets. So already a male dominated industry, but I've been 
very closely working with tag teams in all of these 15 years. So either directly working within a tag team or closely collaborating with uh, tag teams. And um, this is where my experience comes from. Uh, feel free to connect uh, to me via LinkedIn. I will show you some details later also. So let's dive into this. Um, this is, uh, I think, the only thing that I can't really put a finger on where I heard it first and where, what, what the source of this is. You hear this uh, more often. If you go to talks, to conferences, to tech, uh, to tech um, conferences these days, you will hear this a lot. The marketing position of the upcoming years will be a tech position. What does it mean? Uh, it means that uh, job um, job description, job profiles that have typically been non-tech, that have uh, a lot of connection to visual design, maybe to graphics, to um, communication. And in, in these matters, we're also uh, strongly connected to, to women having these positions. Um, are more and more uh, changing to become a position where a lot of IT skills are necessary. And uh, while this is the digitalization that we see, a lot of processes being automized, a lot of processing being digitized, um, at the same time, we're facing this situation here. These are numbers from 2018. And um, to be honest, I haven't found numbers from 2020, but I think they're even worse. Um, among IT specialists in Austria, you can only find 18% women. I have also found uh, other studies where it's only 17%. I will share them in my resources. If you're interested in this, you can dive a little deeper, but let's just leave it here um, uh, like that. So now imagine jobs that have been, um, that have been uh, covered by women a lot in the past are now changing into a more digital direction and need a lot of IT skills, while at the same time, there's just not even 20% women in this field and with these hard and tech skills currently on the market. So what does this mean? It's not only about the jobs, which is for me a very important point. Uh, when we're talking about diversity in general, but also gender diversity in, in specific, it's not just about the jobs. It's not just about these positions and who is fulfilling them, who's getting the opportunity. It's so much more about being in the game and being in this ecosystem and being a part of the conversation, contributing to what's happening in tech, being a part of what, uh, what marketing is doing, what um, marketing is sharing to the community, what is marketing uh, extracting um, as a communi in communication and giving back to tech. We will have a look at uh, these uh, uh, mechanisms where um, where things are reinforcing themselves a lot. So let's have a look here. It's not only about the jobs, it's about the products. If women are not involved in uh, designing technologies, are not in IT and are not IT specialists in Austria, they are also not involved in designing products, apps, for example, web pages, web applications. But also think of these, um, Trigger was just showing these uh, uh, public sector or, or semi-public sector uh, institutions like uh, IMS, for example, and, and these are tech products. You probably have heard of the EIMS uh, platforms or of, of uh, other platforms where you sign up and you're sharing your uh, your social data and it's about your employment, your, your um, social security, about your insurances and all these kind of things. These are built by less than 20% women. Uh, it's about the tech that we don't have access to or that we're not uh, involved in, in creating. It's about data that is not representative um, and that get by, gets biased. We will also have a look at that later on closer and algorithms that are built upon these data sets um, that then reproduce inequalities. It's about the information that we don't get, the chances we can take, the opportunities that are not offered to women if they are not part of this ecosystem, and also about the conversations and the, the, social, the social upbringing and the social conditioning um, that doesn't change if we're not having these conversations. 
Now I know that most of the most of the women, also the men in this group, or that are now um, joining this talk or listening to this talk, maybe at a later point, probably have some kind of tech background. Maybe not being a developer uh, themselves. I am not a developer myself, but working in IT, working with tech teams, having to do with technology, managing technology in some kind every day. Um, so if this is something where you feel like, well this is not really true for myself, then I need to clarify, and that's very important in the beginning, even if this is not true for yourself, it's for example not true for me, it's still true for the majority of women in Austria and in Europe and globally. And this is um, why we're talking about diversity in tech, not because of personal experiences, but about um, the systemic, systematic situation and the structural changes we need. Um, so keep that in mind when we're having a look at the next slides. This is a, I don't want to scare you. <laughs> this is just something I found in one of these studies that have been published very recently by FFG. Uh, for example, it's um, I will, uh, as I said, share my resources so you, so you can have a look. It's really super interesting and it's easy to read. It's one of these studies that's that's easy to read. It's actually really, really exciting. Um, and they had this awesome graphic that I wanted to share. I don't, I don't want to get uh, too much into detail. The only thing I want to point out here is, so look at gender, at the gender column on the left side. This is the one aspect we're talking about today. And if um, your gender causes you to not be involved in the design of technology, in the, in the production, in the creation, in the planning, in the project management of digital products, then this will definitely have an impact. You can have a look at that, uh, how these products are built and if or not they reproduce these inequalities. Now, as you can see, this is only one of six columns. So if you're a woman, that's already, you know, bad enough, so to say. Uh, but then there's also, what about origin? What if you're a woman of color? Uh, what if you're coming from a social background that didn't um, provide you with the education that's needed to, to step up into a specific position? What about regional aspects? What about age and impairment that have, have a lot of um, impact when it comes to access uh, to technologies, access to resources, access to, um, to education? And so, so these all add up in the socialization aspects that we will uh, look into as well. Um, uh, this, this kind of pile up um, have an impact on how products are built and if products are not built uh, for, for the whole population and for, for everyone, then this will like in a like in a spiral again have impact on the people using it because they feel detached don't have access to it can't use it uh, are unable to use it or it doesn't have any benefits for them the slide that we had a look at before where it's about the conversations and the opportunities and the information that are uh, that are unavailable for you if the products are not set up with um, these people in mind um, so to summarize this, as long as certain parts, this goes for all the aspects of diversity, but especially for gender, of course, as long as certain parts of the population do not have access to technologies or are not involved in the design, there will be a, a some kind of amplification, reinforcement of inequalities that already exist. And this is um, why, I, why I'm also advertise, advertising this talk with we need more gender diversity now. We need to do something now about it. And it's getting more and more urgent um, because there's so many, so many uh, um, uh, things going on with digitalization, AI and so on, that, um, that these uh, effects are even um, enforced and increased. So let's have a look where these inequalities come from. So when I say uh, inequalities will be reproduced if uh, women are not involved in, in tech design, then of course there have been inequalities already before. Where do they come from? Let's have a look at that. 
Um, this is just my intro slide into the reasons behind uh, inequalities section of my talk, but I also find it hilarious <laughs> because, as you can see, this is just a very, I guess, I guess all of you have some, some similar examples. This is just a very quick web search, uh, actually on a, on a stock photo uh, page, Paxels, but I don't want to blame Paxels because it's the same if you go to Google, it's the same if you go to stock photos, if it's the same if you go to um, to Unsplash, for example, or any other uh, source, if you Google something or, or search for something like woman and computer, woman and laptop, woman and coding, you will on uh, you will actually actually Pexels is quite good already. You will find a variety of pictures, but the majority and a lot of pictures will go into the direction of a woman using the computer to uh, broadcast uh, makeup videos. A woman using her credit card, luckily. There's even pictures of women in the woods or on meadows where they sit and look beautiful and have a credit card ready and laugh. And it's, it's really hilarious. And, um, and so this is obviously what society thinks uh, you are interested in finding as a result if you're looking for women and computer. That's a first uh, guess in the direction this is going now. Uh, but, okay, oh. <laughs> toning it down a little bit, it's, I, I promise it's not going to get too boring. I don't want to do like a, a whole history class now, but I found an awesome talk by a woman named Amy Cole, uh, who is, um, who's working for a university in the US, and she has just recently, very recently published her talk on inequalities, uh, gender inequalities and, and, and um, cultural inequalities in, uh, in the US education system. So these are US um, figures here, but it's something that is very, very, applicable also to, to Europe. Uh, so what she is saying is, and this is like the basic message here, in the 19, in the 19th century, like very, very long ago, um, C computer science, this is what CS stands for, computer science education was basically um, everything math related, math and science education and formal education at the university was something that you would use to step up in society and to, it was like an entry into the elite um, and it was solely for, for men, obviously. And still in the 1960s, when you were looking at uh, computer, computer science, although there were already a lot, as you might by now may have heard already, a lot of women involved in the actual operational working in computer science, the formal university academic education was still solely set up for white men. And it was basically um, just working on math problems. So it was very detached also from, from actual uh, computer pro uh, um, uh, problems and women in POC faced a lot of sexism and racism. Um, and now the only thing I want to point out with these slides, you can have a look at it more closely when I send it to you if you're interested, but the only key message here is basically not too much changed. Unfortunately, this is not academic bashing now. I also had uh, some CS classes at a university. I know a lot of good uh, programs and obviously it's always what you make of it. There's exceptions to the rule, good professors that, um, that, will, that will give you a very good teaching experience. But coming back to this personal versus structural experience, um, most of the education is still very much math and problem focused, which is not mirroring what you need on the market nowadays. This is not what um, what you feel is you're benefiting from when you uh, when you when you enroll in this program. So what happens is that. Um, women who are basically to told all their life that they can't do math and that they shouldn't enroll in a CS program, like the like the um, quote that Astrid was uh, showing earlier, uh, are now in a program where they actually are kind of um, uh, reassured that this is correct. They are actually wrong in this program. It doesn't make any sense for them. They can't find a job with this. They can't, uh, they can't, um, 
apply what they learn to real world problems and this is not what they need and um, and it's still very yes very focused on logical uh, problems there's still a lot of sexism elitism you still have a high rate of women that might even graduate but not actually work in that field afterwards that's it for that. And now we're getting to this mystification thing and the demystification, which is alone a topic I can uh, talk about for hours because it's really interesting. Because um, what also happens, and Amy Cole is pointing this out in her talk also, what happens in this, in this um, uh, education from the past is that th this enforces fixed mindsets. You usually speak of a fixed mindset or a growth mindset. A growth mindset would be, okay, I can't do it today, but I can learn it and maybe then I can do it tomorrow. A fixed mindset would be, if I don't have the talent and the, the, the ability to do it today, I can just uh, better stop because I will never be able to do it. This will, uh, this will be reinforced. The trope that programmers are born and not made is, is cemented in this kind of education. And this is the mystification of coding. It's about gatekeeping. It's about saying that coding is some kind of um, very difficult, very complex science that you have to have some kind of talent for, you need to be born for it, you have to have some kind of uh, abilities and then have been going through some good education to actually be able to do it. Or some people might be a bit more open-minded, be like, okay, well, maybe you do not need this, um, this high-level education, but maybe uh, you have been working on computers since you are 12 and uh, you've been a computer gamer since you are 14 and you've been in this uh, coding uh, camp, summer camp when you were 16 and so on. So it's that, this is what I mean when I talk of mystification of coding. It's some myth going around this programming that makes it um, um, something that it's not for everyone. It's, uh, it's something that you have to be, um, you have to have some kind of skill already to even touch it. And this basically, from my experience, and this is also what a lot of women I talk to have in, their, in, their, um, in the back of their minds, maybe even unconsciously, um, Coding is strongly related to math and logical problems and um, science, physics, calculations, all these things that they have been told they're not good in. Um, and obviously these things are made for boys, <laughs> which is a social conditioning that a lot of women have been uh, uh, experiencing in their life. So the math would be if coding is math and math is for boys, then obviously boys do the coding and not women. And now, of course, as we've seen on the uh, on the uh, history slide, and this is why I've been showing it, coding is not math, at least not anymore. Coding nowadays is so much more than math. And um, I'm talking about coding a lot because it's kind of the foundation and the root of all the tech products we have. Of course, it's such a broad field. There's so many different aspects than just the bare coding. You can work with low code, with no code, with frameworks. You can be in uh, involved in UX or in visual planning of products. You can be in, um, involved in the user experience and user journey. Um, but the coding itself is also not just math anymore. We, of course, I would rather not talk about if math is actually only for boys, not true, but uh, let's have a look into social conditioning also. And uh, regarding the, the um, coding is for boys part, I want to show you something which is um, needs a little introduction. So for the, for the coding bootcamp that we are offering, 
we were we, we we strongly wanted to have more women in the program and we were trying to think of ways to include more women how can we attract more women to to join such a program and we came up with meetups obviously and um and we're designing a little meetup that would uh, last just three hours in a in an evening um and in these three hours we would of course also talk as you can now notice i can talk a lot so the introduction would be already long and then there would also be pizza and beer so the three hours would boil down to two hours very fast and in these two hours a lot of the almost 80 percent 90 percent female participants of the meetup were able to build a full app a full application using an HTML uh, file to set up um, to set up a structured page that has some content in it, um, setting up a CSS file that's styling the whole thing, just very simple styles, not super nice, not something that you would uh, that you would use on a on a commercial on a professional basis, but having the first concepts of how can I interact with the concept with the content I set up. Um, and then also adding functionality with JavaScript already. Um, this has been uh, an application that we did in uh, December. So that had been a New Year's countdown. For me, it was a bootcamp countdown, but everybody else did a New Year's countdown. Um, and uh, most of the women did not have any upfront experience. They were just, you know, joining the meetup for like, okay, I just want to approach this coding animal because I have never in my life touched this. Everybody is talking about it and I feel I should be able to join the conversation. So now I'm jumping in cold water and I will just try out some things. And this is what they were able to build after two hours. If you if you make it inclusive, if you uh, if you explain enough, if you focus on beginners and if you make sure that um, that um, People can get something out of the, it, some fun, and see if this is for them. Um, so, just a quick example. Um, but where does this come from? Where does this come from that women have this feeling of not being good enough to start with coding, even or start studying tech for that matter? Um, I collected some pictures that is that I'm really hurting myself. It's really, I, it's really causing uh, goosebumps on my on my spine. And uh, but I wanted to show you. I, I don't know. Maybe that's not. Maybe not everybody feels the same way. Maybe you look at the pictures and you're like, yeah, why? That might be because we are already so used to it. But if you once in your life have already broken this window and then you can't unsee these kind of things anymore and then it's really obvious how much bullshit <laughs> is out there and how much uh, um, how much we teach our kids already to um, uh, to go into specific directions where we see them, and I can I can judge from uh, experience. I also have two kids. I do have a boy and a girl, which is nice because it teaches me a lot of lessons when it comes to this. You cannot force uh, neutrality on kids. You cannot just be like, okay, in in our household everything is just green and yellow because we don't want pink and blue anymore. And so you son will now play with the dolls and. You you daughter will now play with the cars. It's not going to work like that. There's society and it's not only you as a parent, you do not have enough influence. It's the kindergarten, it's the peers, the friends, it's family, it's um, neighbors, it's everybody, it's the media and all the toys in the stores um, that is forcing them in a direction and you can't, you can't, you can do your part, you can explain you can, for example, not do a gender reveal party with these kind of gender cakes uh, and already tell uh, the little creature in your womb that they have to be playing football at some point in their life, which is super awkward if you think about it. Um, so you can, that's that's something you can you can contribute, obviously. But um, apart from that, society is very has a very strong impact, and media has a very strong impact. And with the picture in the middle, you can already see that 
uh, it's not only about um, that that maybe women have a tendency to be more visual, to be softer or to be um, good with uh, everything that comes with caring for something. So it's not only good intentions. It's also that it doesn't really count what they think. It doesn't really count what they what they work on. It doesn't really count what they accomplished. It's more about if they look good. And with with boys, on the other hand, it's more about okay, what did you do today? What did you build? What uh, what uh, what books are you reading? What um, show me what you did with your Lego? I I actually can um, uh, I can experience this with myself when uh, when I didn't have kids. Um, uh, friends were visiting us who had kids, and they had a boy and a girl uh, in kindergarten age. Uh, and the boy came in and I was like, oh, look at you. What what do you have there? Or is that Lego awesome? So do you build a car? Oh, that's really crazy. When I was your age, I was also building cars, you know, just chatting and with, with the kids and chatting about what he accomplished and what he built. And then the, the little girl came in and little girls can be amazingly cute. <laughs> like this. So they can be super cute, I know. And what did I say? I told her, oh, look at you, you're so cute. Look at your dress and look at, oh, do you have a bow in your hair? That's super nice. Do you like pink? I love pink. I'm actually wearing pink today. So what I'm, uh, um, what I'm saying is it's not about um, taking things away from kids that they like. If they like pink, they should go with pink. If they like to play with dolls, especially the girls, if they like to play with dolls, let them play with dolls for whatever reason. Why should you prohibit that? But um, but it's about what you what you nurture in them. What is it? Is it that you give credits for what they do? Or is it that you give credits for how they look and it doesn't really matter what they what they're thinking or what they're doing? And then um, once they grow up and they grow older, uh, they will face more and more unrealistic expectations because obviously nowadays um, people have already found out that gender diversity is something that is necessary and that it would be good if also the girls would be coding. But then there's this double standard of, well, of course they should get into tech, but they should still look like this which is also very, very spooky <laughs> if you have a closer look at the picture. I um, got it from a Facebook ad and um, luckily, like fortunately, when I had a look at the comments, there were a lot of people super, uh, super nasty with this picture and were like, okay, take this off. Uh, this is not, uh, you, you can't take this serious. Um, this is not a good picture. Please don't do this. So there was a lot of backlash, which is which is good because uh, I've seen the ad again and they changed it. Um, but this is what what uh, girls are facing when they're growing up. Um, and there's actually also in the resources I can share actually a very nice um, a very nice TED talk by uh, Reshma Saljani, who is uh, the founder of uh, Girls in Code. Um, and she uh, she is talking about exactly this problem, um, how raising girls to be cute and nice, good looking and perfect, uh, and then at a later point in life telling them that they have to accomplish things and do things is a double standard. And it's um, first um, telling them that they shouldn't even start something if they are not intending to acing it. For example, she's giving this example of a playground. Um, so at the playground, you have this monkey bus, Klettergerüst in German, so where the children would go up. So for the, for the boys, parents would usually cheer and would be like, yeah, go on, go on, you can do one more, one more. And if the boys, uh, if the boys succeed, there's applause. If the boys fail and fall down, there will still be applause uh, because we cheer for the child just for trying and just for being brave. And this is this is cool. I don't want to take this away. Don't get me wrong. This is cool because, of course, we should encourage our children to take risks, like calculatable risks, <laughs> especially if you're a mom, you, you know about that it's hard to keep a balance sometimes. But, um, but with the girls, it's, and I see that a lot on playgrounds, with the girls is, of course you can go up the monkey bus, 
Of course you can be on the playground, but you better don't get your dress dirty. You know, that's the double standard. That's the perfectionism already. You can do what the others do, but don't fall down because when you fall down, then you won't be cheered for trying, but you will be scolded for getting yourself dirty. And 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 this is not something that that the girls do. Let this for the boys. And um, and this is this is growing more and more throughout the life. We uh, try to imagine. Uh, if you're not a woman, not experiencing you, uh, yourself, try to imagine this is imposed uh, on you like all your life. From the moment you're still in the in the in your mother's womb till uh, birth, kindergarten, school, education, and your first job. It is also why I picked the picture in the background. Um, you obviously have to be very beautiful if you work on your uh, on your laptop, and you have to sit very straight, and your hair is perfect. And um, and this is what's uh, what's haunting us um, from the very beginning. And it's really hard to break out of this. And now, uh, a lot of a lot of women I talk to will be like. Yeah, but I'm actually fine. I don't see the problem in this. I don't. I don't face any barriers. I don't face. I'm. I'm equal to my male co-workers. I have a good job and I'm fine. And to be honest, either either that's not the case and you just have not realized, or you have not hit the level where you where where. Um, where the where the boys don't want to have you in their group anymore and you actually realize you've been playing in a different league all along. Um, this is called the glass ceiling. Uh, of course there's exceptions. Again, there might be the the exception that you have had a very open-minded and uh, growth uh, mindset um, uh, conditioning and social environment in your life. You found a good job and you actually do have nice co-workers. I don't want to exclude this co uh, completely, but I have been thinking for a very long time in my life that um, that working in tag teams and and uh, working together with uh, in a male dominated uh, environment and industry, I am actually pretty accomplished and established. And I'm on I'm on eye level with my colleagues. And I and it uh, it only took realizing some situations in looking behind, and also kids obviously. Um, to to see that I have actually hit a glass ceiling and I could see my colleagues and, and male co-workers um, progress while I was still uh, stuck at the same level. Um, so again, if you tell these kind of stories, usually the trope will be, well, you're just jealous. <laughs> Obviously the others were better than you and you were just jealous. I can assure you this is oftentimes not the case. Um, there's so many, there's so many personal examples from me personally and from all the people, all the women I talk to. Um, and that this would actually be very interesting also for the discussion maybe when in uh, your professional life have you been, um, uh, have you been uh, exposed to these double standards? Um, have you hit the glass ceiling already? Had, have you had imposter syndrome, which means um, did you have um, trouble assessing your own abilities? Uh, so that you thought you're not good enough, you thought you can't do something, when actually looking back a few years later, you're like, well, I was actually very capable. I was actually better than my coworker. I did all the work, but at that time I was unable to see it because I was I was raised and I grew up in the in the in this uh, thinking of myself that I I can't do it. I'm not good enough. Um, also, going back to this Rashma uh, Sojani talk that I really like, it's very short, it's just 50 seconds, but I didn't want to do this switching to YouTube back and forth now in the screen sharing. So please uh, have a look at this later on, it's awesome. 
Um, so what she's saying also is that if um, if boys apply for a position, for a technical position, for example, they will check the requirements. And if they meet like 50 to 60 percent, they will be like, I can do this. I mean, there's some things I need to learn. There's some things I need to wrap my head around. I need to maybe uh, fresh up or anything, brush up on my skills on this, but I can do this. And if women have a look at the same requirements, they will be like, oh, this is really hard. Mm, I haven't done this a lot. I have done this, but I'm not an expert in this. And if they don't hit 95% of these requirements, they won't apply. Um, I actually uh, experienced this also a lot with our bootcamp students. We, my my co-founder, the teachers and me have a very different judgment and assessment of their skills, which is of course neutral because we're not engaged with any of them and we have too many to uh, to like have our our favorites in there but we will just be very honest and we will be like you can do this this is good and they will be like i'm not applying i'm not ready for this yet i need six more months to work on my projects and then i will apply and we're like oh my god <laughs> so there's a lot of work necessary more with the women than with the men that's a, that's a thing Move on. Stereotypes in tech design are another reason. So this whole social conditioning obviously leads to prejudice. Prejudices? Prejudice? Prejudice is a very hard word for me. Forward title. So in stereotypes, um, where where people think um, have a have a specific user and have a specific person in mind when they think of who's going to use their products. Why? Did I include this? I can hear. I don't know if that's if you can if you can see it uh, well enough. It's uh, it's a car seat with a crash test dummy strapped in the seat belts because there had lately been some um, some media coverage on studies that um, American scientists have found out that uh, these um, crash tests. Had had been done wrong for for the past years and and uh, and tens of years. Like it's it's really really dramatic because um, they found out that these crash test dummies and uh, and then also the the seats and the seat belts are not appropriate uh, if you wanna if you wanna see what the impact of a crash of an accident would be on uh, on women because women have obviously have a different body they have a different um, uh, different proportions they have breasts um, and they have they might be pregnant um, they are usually smaller and lighter and all these things have not been considered um, enough. They have been considered, but not considered enough. And there's a lot of um, a lot of numbers that now showed up that uh, there's um, a lot of um, accidents and injuries that could have been prevented when uh, seatbelt design would have been optimized for more for different body types. Um, so what happens here is if you have a very homogeneous team creating a product, creating a technology, then this team is barely thinking out of their of their needs and um, and value systems. Uh, this just happens. Uh, technology is created by people. You know, it's it's not neutral. It can't be. It it they can obviously they will try to do it. They will try to implement some methodologies to also uh, be more uh, inclusive and accessible, as is also happening with websites nowadays. But if you have a team of five to ten white male developers that all have a very similar upbringing, education and background, uh, then there will be very much less perspectives and influences um, as, as if there would have been women, for example, but also other diversity aspects in the team. Um, at best, this only creates barriers, but in a lot of cases, this creates technology that is not usable or even dangerous. There has been a really nice example in one of the resources I checked um, in, in creating this, uh, this session. 
and it uh, it gave this example of um, radio frequencies in the US that had been turned down to a lower frequency rate. Um, there wasn't there wasn't a reason for that. I might have to um, uh, do some research on that uh, too. But let's just assume there was some obviously uh, good reason to reduce the the frequencies of these radio waves. And this kind of totally excluded women because women have a higher frequency rate, uh, and they were barely understandable at all. And they were not considering that there might be at that time, I think it was in the 19, late 20s, 1927, that in these times there might be female leaders somewhere or female speakers. They didn't have that in mind. And there were, there were politicians, female politicians, that actually had to actively um, have vocal trainers to lower their voices to fit this, uh, to fit this uh, frequencies again. Crazy, crazy examples. You can you can go down rabbit holes if you have a look for these examples online. Um, biased data, biased algorithm. You might have heard of that. This is really really um, um, co common. Is not the right word. This is something that is really really um, current at the moment. And this is also something why I introduced this talk with. We need gender diversity now more than ever. It's super, super important that we get women and other uh, other uh, people with uh, um, with other aspects of diversity get into the process of uh, planning, creating, publishing technologies uh, because um, data sets are usually biased. Um, so the way you pick data for a project, you, the way you select the data, the, the way uh, the source where you pick the data from, you yourself with having a specific project in mind already have a prejudice when you're, when you're picking data. And this kind of adds on and adds on and adds on. And if you're now thinking of having big data, having um, artificial intelligent algorithms on top of that, if there's a slight bias or inequality already in the data set, in the logic of the process, in the logic of the algorithm, and if there's already an imbalance, then this will quadruple and multiply and reproduce. And then this algorithm will tell you the truth about the world and what's going on nowadays. And you will be like, oh yeah, that's what the algorithm calculated. So let's feed the data set again with this result. So this is what uh, meant with reproducing because everything that the that the algorithms show will obviously reflect back on the source of the data, and um, and this is why we need more diversity in tech. Not the only reason, obviously there are a lot of reasons, but this is one of the main things where I feel uh, we are now at a at a crossroad where we have uh, the, the ability to kind of turn around the steering wheel and, and go in a direction, but there's already so many uh, examples of biased algorithm. That's actually a good search term. If you're interested in this topic, biased algorithm is something that you can um, that you can uh, search for real easily. Um, then you will find a lot of examples where, um, uh, for example, computer vision pro uh, products, that's a very common example, uh, um, have uh, difficulties um, uh, recognizing black people, for example, um, which is obviously awful, but there's also other examples where um, uh, women, uh, female problems, also medical problems are not considered, not detected fast uh, fast enough to, to provide medical um, uh, help, for example, because um, there have been some, uh, some biases in setting up this whole uh, technology in the beginning. Um, so a root of this algorithmic uh, inequality stems from a chronic lack of diversity is also what I found in Forbes article, also in the resources, have a look at this, there is some nice explanation of this, um, of this effect. Obviously, there's also sexism. So what we have now covered until now is not even sexism. Usually when we talk about gender inequalities, this is what's kind of 
sometimes people think is meant by, by that, but it's just a part of it. There's so much more sexism is just a part and sexism is already huge. And um, with, uh, with sexism, it's also a very broad range because people tend to think um, that with sexism, we're, we're speaking of, you know, somebody grabbing your butt or somebody can't take their eyes of your of your breasts in a in a professional setting or something like that. But it doesn't have to be like that. What's meant with microaggressions here is that that when you're in a professional setting and um, uh, and somebody is um, is not taking you seriously as an expert, but rather referring to you only as a woman. Then, then this is obviously something that is um, uh, super challenging because it, it takes away the focus from your work. You can't get through with ideas. You will always be questioned. You will be invisible. Um, you will feel uncomfortable. Um, and there will be these stereotypes that you can't get rid of and you cannot, um, you cannot position yourself as an expert if, if uh, everybody's talking about uh, how you should smile a little more. You should, you look a bit, uh, you look a bit uh, stressed today. No, why? You look so much better when you smile. That's something that I got a lot. <laughs> My face when I am working focused is super aggressive. I know, I know that by now, and maybe it's something I would like to work on, and I do. But telling me this means that you that you're solely focused on how I look when I work, and that you feel comfortable when you work in my in my vicinity. Uh, then that you're interested in that that I can actually get stuff done. Um, there's a there's a nice collection of Alice Bittel that I like to who I like to follow on Twitter. She's a front end developer, very accomplished one, helping beginners a lot. So if you're into coding, she's a good person to follow. Maybe you know her even. Um, she has published an article on DevTO and and some other female developers have followed where she is not writing any comment. Um, or any text. She's just collecting, not all, by far not all, but a lot of the things she gets on a daily basis when talking about tech, obviously. So sharing resources, sharing a coding problem, giving advice, and then the things that uh, that will be the response. Um, I was I was thinking of going through this in detail, but I won't. <laughs> this is a very nice article, a letter to the editor by a by a senior um, engineering graduate uh, from a university who said um, the women in my engineering class are not my equals, which is obviously a catchy title because he means the opposite. Um, the key message in this uh, article he wrote that got a lot of attention uh, five years ago is that he says, at the point when I will graduate, women with the same education will have gone through so much more um, judgment, um, distraction, harassment, microaggressions, people telling them that they are not good enough, um, uh, people telling them that this is not for them and they should seek a different career. Um, if they actually succeed, they will be the quote Frau, the diversity hire. And if and now we're back to the playground monkey bar example. If he succeeds, he, everybody will say he earned it. If they succeed, uh, it will obviously because somebody has helped them. So um, uh, what he says in the end is, uh, you and I cannot be equal. You have already conquered far more to be in this field than I will ever face. Um, very nice read, very nice thing. Good, good base for discussion also, uh, especially with uh, male colleagues. Have a look real quick. There's this spiral of inequality. We have uh, talked about most of this already. There's only a few women in IT. This is called the leaky pipeline. Uh, a lot of women drop out uh, due to all the things, due to all the inequalities we had a look at. So this uh, unequal education, uh, sexism, social conditioning, the feeling of not belonging, uh, the feeling of uh, not being good enough for this, not trying in the first place, all these kind of things. That's why there's even less female decision makers 
um, technologies reproduce these inequalities and so on and so on. But so this is what I found in the resources that I used. Very nice graphics and it's kind of uh, enforcing and cementing itself, which is why we need to break it, which is why we need to make this the spiral of opportunity. And um, this is actually now the point where I would like to turn this around and have a look at what we can do and why. Because everyone can have some impact in, in, um, in, in making a change and achieving more di diversity. We have to rush a little bit though. Um, uh, so why do we have to change? That's a question like, ooh, why would you even ask that? Obviously, we need more gender diversity in tech. This is what people tell you. A lot of people will uh, repeat that. A lot of people will have that in their marketing messages. But this is not about political correctness. If we're talking about why we need to change, it's because um, the things we already talked about, if women don't have access, if women are not a part of the design, then these inequalities will even increase. Uh, with big data and AI, this effect will be uh, sped up even more. Um, but there's other, um, other reasons as well. Uh, so for the employers in this talk, for the men in this talk, for the men and employers you're talking to maybe after this talk and discussing, why would we need gender diversity? Because it is not focused to uh, improve the situation for women. It's uh, gender diversity and feminism seeking a better situation for everyone. And I've once heard this nice metaphor that uh, equality is not a cake. Like, uh, like um, justice is not a cake. If you give a part to one person, then does, that doesn't mean that there's less for the other group. It's you can actually have equality and a better life for everybody. Like if you if you think again of this um, gender reveal cake, it's not only that you're pressing the unborn girl into the role of being a being a ballerina. It's also that you're pressing the unborn boy to be a, a super achiever and excel in a male dominated uh, sports and, and 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 industry later on. Um, so it's about um, having a look at people's uh, skills. What can they actually do? What's their sweet spot? What are their strengths? And focusing on that and leaving the gender out part. Um, uh, make sure that your company is sustainable for the future. If you're not come, uh, in, if you're not having diverse teams, you will have a lower innovative potential. You're missing out on sales markets. If you're designing your products for men only, and there's some nice examples again in the resources uh, for Danfoss, for example, who have had a smart home uh, application that was uh, um, uh, barely used by any women, then you're missing out. You're missing out. You're losing uh, sales potential. Um, and you're obviously also uh, having uh, better chances of, uh, of finding good and skilled uh, people for your teams if you're looking everywhere and not just in, in specific parts of the population. What can you do? Womendo? <laughs> space missing. What can Womendo? Uh, Womendo can, um, and I guess that a lot of you are already doing this, so this is more of a in general and, and maybe remind yourself, maybe you're doing 90% of this, but Take the other 10% and have a look at it. I think what women can do, employees can do, is understand the basics of technologies. If you think there's something that is super important, for me, for example, it was cryptocurrencies. I heard this as a buzzword all around last year. Everybody was talking about blockchain and I was like, oh my God, I don't understand a thing. Read something about it. Join a talk, join a meetup. have somebody explain it to you uh, at a lunch break or whatever, get into it. Um, if somebody is, is saying, I'm not a tech person, cut that off. Don't say it yourself and don't let it pass if somebody else uh, is saying it. That's like saying, um, I don't care about the world. I don't care about politics. I don't care about geography. Mm, doesn't matter where the borders are. <sighs> yes, of course, <laughs> you can do that if you want to spend the rest of your life in, your, in the woods and you actually can afford doing that. That's fine. 
but uh, but tech is everywhere. Tech is at the heart of everything, and not only the bad tech, like the industrial technologies, but also if you wanna uh, if you wanna have a more sustainable uh, industries, if you wanna go for green technologies, if you're looking at environmental climate change, all these good tech also, it's still tech. If you wanna change something, you have to get into tech. Be curious. Find your resources. If books don't work for you, find a podcast. If podcasts don't work for you, find a meetup where you can go to. Um, so find something that fits your style. Um, try out new things. I actually, this is something, for example, where I have to force myself, but I do it on, proactively on purpose. If I don't understand something, I install the app. Obviously, this is not only app, app like mobile apps, but all kind of applications. Lately, it was, for example, TikTok. Um, so what I did is not only uh, sign up for TikTok and download the app, but I, I want to understand what's going on here. Like, how is this app built? What's different? How are they making money? What's the business concept? What's the impact on people's life and on society? How, what's the political aspects of this? Because it's an Asian app and, uh, and the US don't want it. Actually, they're thinking of prohibiting it even. Um, try something new. Uh, try coding, for example. I can uh, I can provide you with some good resources, and I can assure you I will do it unverbindlich, like non-binding. You do not have to talk to me about our coding bootcamp. But if you say, hey, this sounds interesting, super interesting, I would really love to try some JavaScript. Do that. Talk to me. I have uh, just send me a message, and I, I can share some free resources and dare to fail. Like, you do not have to excel. You do not have to be super perfect at coding. You do not even have to be a developer. My God, you can, you, you, you can, you could be a hairdresser if you want to, but, but try it. And it's okay if it doesn't turn out perfect, but, um, but dare to try something new and wrap your head around it. Uh, and there's also some things for what can employers do or people um, like men who are not faced by all these um, uh, by all these conditionings and impacts. Um, try more to internalize that diversity is not a burden, but something that's where everyone and society will benefit from in the end. And it's an opportunity to make things more innovative, innovative to have more perspectives, more insights, um, more impact. And, um, and try to, if you're an employer and you're looking for people, try to uh, see what are the, what are the, main skills we definitely need because there are these kind of skills and that's totally fine that you do have a list of things that you really need. But then there's also a list of either nice to have or things that you can learn on the job. Be a bit more flexible with that and make it visible in your in your job application that this is uh, a negotiation part and where you can find a solution on how to onboard people. Um, instead, focus a bit more on soft skills and with soft skills in women. I do not mean being nice and having a good communication with clients because that's just one of so many soft skills. Maybe people can um, can be good mediators in a team. Maybe people can uh, organize better. Maybe people can um, are good teachers and can um, uh, share knowledge better with other departments. All these kind of things. Uh, ensure psychological safety. Be a good role model. Like check your own wording. Check what you're thinking and uh, let your words follow what you what you learned already. Um, and then reach out to networks like this one reach out to uh, uh reach out to institutions and, and and companies that focus on this share your knowledge see how others are doing reach out to the new it girls and uh, obviously as a um, meetup groups that are doing the, uh, similar work there's a lot already and um, as you can see they're doing a great job um and this the last one the last point here is something that i'm really really passionate about is because I hear that a lot. When I go to conferences, I hear a lot, yes, you know, we would love to onboard women, but we can't find them. There are not a lot. And um, what I usually uh, tend to answer is try to think of female developers or female um, future co-workers as if they would be clients. If this would be somebody that you could have some 
benefit out of like some money that you could money make money with this target market or some 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 market that you could sell product to you would definitely find a way to target this market uh, so you would probably think of hmm, how could we approach them I would like to sell this but um, maybe I have to rephrase my wording or maybe I need a different campaign or maybe I need to go in a different channel because I can't find my target group here do the same when you're looking out for um, uh, for people. Trigo going uh, uh, up front was a good example. Reaching out uh, to communities is already a good first step. This is exactly the way to go. This is me. Um, I'm glad the video worked. It didn't in the beginning, but here you have a picture of me also. <laughs> I really like talking. I really like to get in touch with people. Um, you can um, write me an email. I'm actively following on a lot of social media <laughs> channels, but not sharing any content other than through up levels. Uh, but on LinkedIn, I'm pretty active. So if you want to reach out, if you want to discuss something, options, um, uh, tech options, uh, uh, gender diversity uh, topics, then uh, then um, please feel free to, to reach out. And uh, yes, I think Astrid and Doris will say something about how I could provide you with a PDF version of this or how I could share my resources and, and um, if not, you can obviously just get them from me personally. That's it. And now, uh, a, little, a little bit what does your timer I say? What does your timer say? My timer says one hour and three minutes. I wanted to be like 50 minutes, but sorry. <laughs> it was super interesting. So I think um, it's yeah, totally it fine if you talk more. I think. Um, How can I see everybody again? I need to stop this somehow. I can. Ah, stop. let me see. Presentation beenden. Okay. Oh, I see people left. <laughs> okay. No, I think not. no. I, I didn't count. I was just making jokes. Sorry. I no, didn't. I think uh, I think we're all still here. <laughs> yeah. cool. Good job, <laughs> Thank you very much. It uh, was really interesting. I I think um, especially what you mentioned now at the end as well with the how how to find people. Mm -hmm. Oh wait, I, I will turn down my volume a little bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, you realize that also with the new IT girls, when we are looking for speakers with women, it's many times um, that we actually have to go to them and say, hey, I think you have this and this topic. Wouldn't you be willing to to speak? And then they're like, oh, I don't know if it's interesting enough and if people would really care. And I think it's the same with um, job offerings. So women tend to be more thoughtful um, many times when it comes to am I the right person? And they might not apply if we don't go directly go to them. So I really also like um, that um, Trigo, for example, sponsors these events um, because it's perfect opportunity to get to know a new community which maybe um, they wouldn't directly come to you if if you would just post a job offering somewhere and I think this is really important to also consider how different people and it's not only about women and men also different personalities like to be addressed and and um, talked to so really good point uh, we also had quite some discussions and um, comments in the chat, so you can read through it. Yeah, I'm reading through it now. I'm like, oh no, I missed this. I want to be part of it. <laughs> I'm now reading. <laughs> no, really, really cool. Are there any questions for Antje? And I would suggest you can either just unmute yourself and speak up. I think there were some quite some interesting comments, so. I don't have any questions, um, a lot of thoughts. I think we can all relate to all of that, like feeling not good enough and hmm, should I do this, should I not? Okay, this job, but I haven't done this, this and that. Or maybe I've done it, but I'm not the expert. Or you're working in an IT company, but you're more in sales and marketing. And if someone asks, wow, you're in IT, do you develop? No, I'm, I'm like in sales and marketing. So we tend to make us small all the time, even though like, in my job, there are technical things involved. I do a little bit with JavaScript. I do like server setups, 
but I don't consider myself as being technical, even though I am. And all that social conditioning. Yeah. Yeah. Same here. That's that's what I meant with the introduction. I still I still am pretty vague in introducing myself. I realized that I did a lot more tech things than some tech people that call themselves tech people. Um, but I'm I'm still saying I'm sales. <laughs> it's, it's yeah. It's crazy. It's crazy how this is in in your brain. Um, I want to share one example from uh, from the boot camp, which is super, which hit me like a like a like a ball, really hard. Is that um, is this failing thing? A lot of women are hesitant and don't dare to fail. So what they're doing is they're planning what they want to write, which code to write up front. They're planning up front, like the planning session takes half a day and they're having paper and they're having wireframes and they're using digital products for this and they're planning and it's, they want to perfectly understand what to do before typing the first line of code. The guys would just go like and hammer in some code, would get an error message and the error message points them to where their mistake is. In coding, you need the error messages because they're basically telling you what to do. So coding is about trying, failing, trying, failing. And this is a super, super hard experience for most of our um, women on the on the on the program. Yeah. And that's really that's really crazy to see. Yeah, we're, we were never taught that failing is OK. Yes. And it's actually good because then you see, okay, this didn't work, then try the other option. I mean, that can, you know, it can be good. And um, it's it's something that's hard to to understand. Yeah. So going to the comments here, super interesting. <laughs> Paulina, you read that book already? Or you did you just, did you just buy it? Yes. Um, uh, I, I belong to, to those kinds of person who buys books but don't don't really read them. Uh, well, not yet. I started, but uh, I've heard a lot about it. And uh, I think this example with um, uh, with um, how it's called security belt. Um, yeah, it, it's uh, also mentioned in, in in the beginning of the book. Have um, you read it? No, I haven't. I haven't. Uh, I'm I'm very bad with books. I'm very good with podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> Also good yep. with with um, any. Uh, actually, now that I try forced myself to try it, I love TikTok. <laughs> so I'm really good for the short content. <laughs> I need the but time. But you're also great for for big content because I just wanted. I, I don't have any questions, but I wanted just to mention what a great speaker you are, uh, and it was oh. extremely entertaining, extremely interesting, and with uh, really like. Good mood and good vibe, just super well done. Yeah, I'm forcing myself to just say thank you <laughs> and not <laughs> but. <laughs> so thank you. Just thank you. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Perfectly fine. Very nice. Yeah, you can obviously just unmute and say something. You do not have to have questions. We can we can just rant a little bit. So. <laughs> Yeah, I'm trying to see this. Um, Maybe one one question, like, I guess it's not just me, but many of you, when you hear all those things, you get angry. Like, how do you deal with that anger about society and what we're facing and this disadvantage? It's like, sometimes I'm like, ah. yeah. yeah, yeah, feeling a little bit helpless, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, same here, same here. Um, it's it's still this this double standard thing. It's like you can get into tech, of course. You can be curious. You can force yourself to learn some things, but then you will still face this. Um, uh, yeah, face these these uh, biases and inequalities. And um, yeah, I've been. Uh, I've been working in a tech company and, and there were a lot of, we had a lot of offices with glass doors and uh, in all the other offices, obviously only male developers. And then there was this office with product management and marketing, which was my colleague and me to obviously the women in product management and marketing. And there were, there were um, plumbers coming because the toilet was clogged and they came in and they were like, 
so the apparently the uh, the men's bathroom is uh, is uh, clocked and we're like okay <laughs> like we don't even know because we don't we, we, we barely go there but you might want to ask some of the guys and they were like they they couldn't understand they were like yeah but somebody has to show us i'm like yeah you better ask a man <laughs> i'm not gonna show you the men bathroom but they were just assuming coming into the office that um oh, the developers developers oh, let's go here that must be the the reception that must be like the secretariat or something and um so this happens a lot i guess i guess everyone has uh, has a story like that yeah. And it's okay if it happens in this context, but in some other form, it also happens in prof in more professional contexts. So you're sitting in a conference room, you're um, you're uh, having an opinion, you're you're saying um, you're having an, an uh, suggestion for a project, and we'll go just that's just stupid that nobody will listen and and people will act proactively say well that's you, we can't do that that's that's bonkers like why why would we do that what what a weird what a weird input and then like two hours later uh some random guy in a suit yes. and i don't exactly it's exactly like that it's some random guy in a suit would exactly say repeat what you suggested and people will be like Oh, that's smart, right? That's There's exactly even a name right. for that phenomenon. Yeah. It's quite common, I think. Yeah. Is there a name for it? I think so, yeah. yeah. And there it's are even it's studies it's that when you're in a meeting, if it's just men, no. you should say something in the first 20 minutes because that's when the men are like fighting for their ranks, so like who's more up and they won't hear what you're saying. Oh, so that's interesting. Who they're fighting and then you can make your point and then you, it's more likely that you're hurt. Ah, cool, cool. I need to remember that. That's good. I actually so after twenty minutes. So oh, sorry, Paulina, go ahead. Uh, after twenty uh, minutes. Yeah, more or less. I think it was something like twenty minutes. Yeah. Ah, that's cool. I really like the example of the conference room because uh, what I realized um, when I started to work, um, also many times being the only women internally in meetings that um, for example if customers would come or partners i would usually be the person to ask if someone wants something to drink mm -hmm. and i really no i mean it sounds funny but i stopped doing that because then it was only always me bringing the water like a servant i mean it's so stupid but i really stopped and i'm always waiting until someone else asks same with taking notes i was often taking notes taking um, and then people were starting to say, like, Astrid, can you write it down? And I was like, I mean, I'm not your secretary. Can you please write it down yourself? And it happened so many times. And I, I don't think that they, like it was intentional or, or it meant in any bad way. But I just stopped also. To, if someone says, who can take notes? And even if they ask me directly, I, I'm saying no now. Yeah. Yeah, the note the notes taking example is is also a very typical one. Yeah, yeah. Yes, and uh, we were we were just uh, discussing before um, in our group at the at the boot camp. Uh, uh, one of the students was asking, so is there this thing that people actually think that back end is more for men and front end is more for more for women? Uh, and I'm like, well, this is. This is like is soccer for boys and ballet for girls. It's like the same. It's like the same thing. But um, but obviously everybody can do both. But here again is this double standard perfectionism thing because if a man goes, I'm really good at back end, but front end, you know, the designing part, and so that that's just not my that not not my thing. That's super fine. Of course, that's fine. If you're not into it, why should you focus on it? No. So everybody will be like, okay, that's fine. But if a woman says, 
I'm really good in front-end design. I like website layouts and animations. I'm really good in CSS and front-end libraries and all these kind of things. And uh, But back-end, that's just not my style. I don't like it. Then it's more like yeah, doing the girly stuff, right? <laughs> yeah, you know, the designing, changing the colors. That I know girls are better than that. And it's like that's double standards, you know, because front-end can be just as complex and, and it's, uh, it's just a different kind. The, I, I, I had this somewhere in the slides and I kicked it up because uh, there wasn't enough time is this that coding or tech or IT is like saying communication basically you know it's like there's so many different languages in this communication and there's so many different fields I mean you can be really good in IT security and have no clue about designing a website. You can be you can be super good in setting up uh, database structures or, or I don't know and and have no clue about I don't know UX and how to how to have a consistent user journey or something like that. I, I mean you know there's so many so many aspects in technology and IT um, that it's um, that it's really really impressive how people can always have a very a very clear black and white uh, and and uh, female male description there because it's that's not possible i mean no so any of you in uh, in in coding like um i would love to hear are there any developers i um, would like to i would like to add in it i yeah, am not able to on on my uh, switch on my camera um, no, but my name is Udita Chakraborty, and I can you are you able to hear me? Udita? Yeah. 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 Ah, yeah, I hear you. Okay, uh, so I would like to share my experience. Like I am from India, and uh, there are certain things which I would really want to share. Yeah. And the, number one, number one, um, it it is really concerning to me to see that. We, we we in India think that uh, we come from an Asian culture and we have this respect for people and we are always the service minded and, and things. But it is very concerning for me to think that girls in Western countries also feel this partiality or they or they feel this, uh, you can do this or you cannot do this. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's, it's really something which is concerning me. And the second thing I also want to tell you that I am coming from India. And when I came into Denmark, you know, this this language thing uh, is a big barrier in, in finding a job. Very big barrier. Yeah. So what happened is uh, there are five modules uh, like you have to learn, keep on learning the language. And uh, I was not getting a job and it was very, very difficult. But yes, I, I used up my time and there are five modules in learning this language. And within one year or one, one year, three months, I am in the fourth module. Okay, so I have heard people say that um, since you are a girl, you are not logical. Okay, uh, you can just mug up things, and so you are so good at learning language. It hurts me. It, it hurts a, me. It's awful. I'm sorry. I'm sorry you have to experience that. Um, this is this is what I wanted to show with these uh, columns that gender is that is just one aspect, and if you happen to be a girl, then that's that's one thing. But then yeah. there's obviously. Um, in a country, especially in a country like Austria, it's hard if there's other uh, things already um, uh, adding additionally to that. And um, that's, for for example, these biases uh, regarding different cultures. I would have a question. In in India, there's this trope. I don't I don't even know if it's true. There's this there's this uh, trope that uh, in India there's more women in tech. There's a yeah. lot of more women yeah. in technology, coding, development careers. Do you think it's more equal, or is it is it kind of just a, you know, yes, more women getting into tech, but not having the impact, not having the decision maker positions. You know what I mean? Um, you can say yes. Uh, there are there are many uh, coders. There are many engineers in India, uh, like in, into technology. But yes, um, we are also kind of uh, what should I say? Uh, we are also more into taking responsibility of our family. 
maybe you can say that uh, a man can uh, can stay up till 12 o'clock at night and can do his job but a woman she has to get back cook for in-laws for family and kids and so you know we have we have this family thing over here so yeah. a daughter-in-law is not a good daughter-in-law if if she is not um, uh, taking care of in-laws and all these stuff so this happened so yeah. it's it's not it's not all of her all all over in india it's yeah. not uh, in all of that but it is there i have heard my friends getting back from office at 11 o'clock at night and still making 21 breads for their in-laws i have heard that i have heard that if the maid is not coming she has to like wipe clean the floor broom the floor and then go to office so Crazy. i have seen that Crazy so idea. yeah <laughs> Do, did you did you find a job already in Austria? Uh, I'm not in Austria. I stay oh. in Denmark. You're where? I stay in Denmark. In Denmark. Ah, okay, cool. Yeah. How's the situation there? Are people a bit more open towards? Uh... Um, yes. Uh, yes and no. <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah, sometimes I have heard people saying no to me because. Because I come from a different nationality because of their privacy and everything, and uh, language is a big barrier over here. So, so uh, yes, the more, uh, the faster you learn the language, the faster are your chances. I see. Yeah. So, Same goes for yeah. Austria. Yeah. 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 So it's like that. Yeah. So still also in coding, also despite the fact coding is not super language dependent and despite the fact you speak English, it's it's still something where, where you're required to speak Danish? Yes, because uh, you have the customers who are, who are okay, speaking in, in Danish and then uh, mostly uh, like I, I do not stay in the capital region, I stay in the Jutland region. So, yeah. uh, so, so over there you have people who are, who are talking in, in Danish and you have got customers who are uh, talking in Danish. So in that sense, I have seen that I have cracked interviews very nicely and I could hear the interviewer saying that good answer, good answer. But the next day I get an email uh, that uh, we cannot take you because there's a lot of sparring with the uh, um, senior developers in Danish and uh, with the, with the clients and though and so we are yeah. sorry. So yeah. it's it's heartbreaking. I must say it is heartbreaking. Yeah, yeah. it is. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. Um, I want to share as well my experience. Yes. Uh, I can. Uh, I came from El Salvador. Mm -hmm. okay. We had very unequal gender in our country. I'm industrial engineer, and most of the time, the industrial engineer is more for for men in my country. And mm -hmm. all the people say, "But why are you studying as an engineer? We were only eight women and more than twenty men in our generation in our mm -hmm. class." Then. Uh, into the to find a job is another easter it's like uh, yeah well you are more special is with more um skills but yeah this is opportunity for a men and exclusively say gender men oh <gasps> uh, yeah it, it was kind of difficult and my first job was in a, a international company that they had different mindset not mm -hmm. like in the local companies or media companies so right now it's a little bit different but 20 yeah 10 years ago when I started to find a job it was so hard yeah. and then I started to start uh, to study uh, project management and my master in a uh, business administration so it can be different, opens more opportunities because you are not pitch. And yeah, welcome to the world that the women are in these kind of things. Mm -hmm. So then um, one company hired me in um, as an IT project manager. And then I start a new challenge with the team that all of them, they were men. And the boss was the girl. And it was such a very difficult for me to say who is the person she's she don't know she's not 
system engineer, she just don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then I say, well, but I'm the manager and you have to make what I say. And yeah. Then I, I was so aggressive, not, not aggressive in the bad way because I'm so team leader. I really yeah. always be pro, pro in pro team leaders and, and business and so on. But yeah, this is the, the experience with the people in my country especially. But I hear in Austria when I came here one year ago, it's the same history. I found a friend of my friends that they say, well, uh, why do you study engineer? This is for a man. And so on now in these years. So uh, it's, it's kind of that we have people that they have this fixed mindset or whatever. And uh, as well, yeah, right now here is totally difficult for me to find a, a job as well. And as a self-employed clients in America, but imagine if you are as a project manager in, in related topics as IT or so on tech, it's, it's hard to, to, to really get into this culture. Is companies are not like international companies. So yeah, this is the big challenge for me right now. And then I have been fighting with all of these years ago. Because it's not normal that the women are more involved in these topics. So, yes, with your explanation and you are very, very good uh, with this topic, and I want to say thank you. It, yes, it's all of them, all of your um, statements. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> I, I can relate so much. So I think the, the, the very important part is uh, what can we do? What can we do to improve this? Because I think it's a it's the same thing all over the globe. And obviously we will not make it without the men. Like uh, mm -hmm. we we need we need you. <laughs> we need the men to, <laughs> because if they don't change, if they don't see that this is about them as well and that if, that this is beneficial for all of them, we won't get far. And um, unfortunately, we can't just solve it on our own. It's you need the allies. You need the, the because it's also about. I don't want to compare it totally now to the Black Lives Matter movement. Don't get me wrong, but it's the same uh, effects there. You have the same system, uh, systematic. Uh, systematic inequality, systematic um, uh, uh, power movements of power, and if you do not have allies in the in the in the structure that is currently uh, the majority in this system, then it's really uh, then it's really hard to change something because then you you only like. On the, on the bottom and you have less impact and less, less power. So what we can do is network, we can stick together, we can um, of course care for each other, which is also something that I was really bad at a couple of years ago, because there's this thing that if there is only a very few amount of women in a tech team or in a, in a management team or in, a, uh, in an IT company, then what happens is that um, uh, the few ones that are there will be competitive and they are told to be competitive. They are told from a very young age that they have to be competitive and that they have to fight if they want to get somewhere, especially in a male dominated industry. And what happens is this what especially men call Stutenbissigkeit, this, this, um, this girl fights and this uh, mm -hmm. talking bad behind each other's back and so on. And I'm, I'm, uh, this, is, this is something where women also have to unlearn things and have to, have to learn to be more caring for each other, which is something that, that in a professional setting, I'm not talking about, you know, girls having a girls night out or something like that obviously these friends together can have fun and be supportive but you know in a professional environment a lot of women are, have been told for years and years that they that they shouldn't work together because they won't they won't benefit from that in fact they will lose 
if they work together. It would be better if they partner with the men because these are the ones that can get them somewhere. These are the ones with the opportunity. Those are the ones with the power, with the, with the, uh, with the knowledge. So it's better to go with the men. But in fact, this is hurtful for, for everybody again. And, and so, yeah, I think uh, uh, doing a little something uh, for, for each other goes a long way here. Yeah. Never you see um, somebody else in need. <laughs> I, that's why that's why I actually mean that seri seriously. So if you want to reach out on LinkedIn, do so. I'd be happy to connect there and um, stay in touch and discuss uh, ideas and 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 so on. As to the thing you just shared, I had a I had a I had a similar thing. Maybe I can find it. Can I add something here? Can I? How can I share something? Ah, wait, wait a second. I think I have a link. In no. the chat, you should be able to. Yeah. Uh, I saw it on on Instagram a couple of times now, and I think it's a really good uh, description because you also said aggressive. But it's many times we really need to start reframing. It's like saying thank you if a person gives you a compliment, and not yeah, but yeah, yeah, but this person helped you. No, just thank you. Definitely. I can't share a, just a file. There's only linking. Did you share a link or did you share a file? How did you do I that? shared the picture. Hmm. I want to do the same. <laughs> I will find out. Maybe I can't. Maybe I can just, can I just copy paste? I will try. <laughs> I have a similar, my picture is just similar. <laughs> but it's it's this framing of how you act, you know, when you're, when you're, um, um, like, like you said that, when you, when you want to lead your bossy and uh, all these kind of things. So maybe I have a different one here. But you need to say if you want to, if you want to stop. This is kind of my 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 girls' night out because I um, yeah hey Judita thanks for joining if you have to leave that's fine but my husband took over the kids tonight so I'm <laughs> you're <laughs> off <laughs> yeah I'm off I can have a girls' night out this is the Corona version of girls' night out um, I can't add anything I, I <laughs> whatever you can I'll send it to me I can share it if you want to yeah. Now that I'm, that's what I was doing when you saw me moving things around here. I had to connect to the power outlet. Oh yeah, that's a good point. Me too. Um, thank you. Let's <laughs> <laughs> picture because that's. I sent it to you on LinkedIn because that was the first thing I have opened. Sounds good. Ah, okay. Dita, I see. Uh, Alrighty. Cool. Yeah, there's so many things um, um, that could add to this. About this perspective thing, this is also something where I like to really talk about uh, I talk to a lot of companies and uh, um, hiring departments and uh, people looking for um, looking for developers and um, something that that often that's often a, a an issue that I can that I can relate to but it's all also very critical is this thing we uh, we do not uh, only need the diversity but also the cultural fit was that some of you sharing this on LinkedIn lady I, I saw it in some of these mm, networks so this means um, yes of course we want diversity but we also need a, a, a team that is working good together and we are also hiring for cultural fit and this, these concepts are kind of clashing sometimes. And I can definitely understand that, especially if you have a, um, I don't know if it's uh, always for small teams, but there might be situations or specific setups where it's really hard to onboard somebody that's uh, the true opposite 
of uh, what your team is at the moment. And then from a from a mix of perspectives and having more input and being more in, inclusive, it would be nicer to have a very um, different person in the team. But from a cultural fit perspective, you want somebody that fits in and feels comfortable and doesn't leave because the person has to feel good also. So there's these this is a very um, this is also a very uh, interesting conversation because I th obviously that there, there has to be both but I think that um, the cultural fit would have to follow the diversity like you should maybe change your culture to be more inclusive and then diversity would fit better so what I, that I think, I think kind of um, uh sometimes um, taking as an excuse maybe um, for the like being the reason that we cannot hire this and this person. No. But as you said, I agree. I think um, you have to change the culture to actually make it more attractive for more diverse workforce to come there. And for example, our team is um, quite diverse, I would say. So we are equally men, women now. Mm -hmm. um, ranging from 30 to 50 something mm -hmm. and sometimes it's really like there are a lot of discussions <laughs> but I think that makes it so interesting you know because yeah. they're like they can learn from me because I'm the youngest and they see a lot of things very different because they always made, did it like that and I'm coming there and I say, but it doesn't make sense for me. And on the other hand, I can learn so much from them because they have 20 plus years of experience, mm -hmm. which is so cool if you're working with um, people who are so experienced and they are actually sharing all of the mistakes maybe they made and that you can avoid them, you know? So it's, I think even though we have a lot of um, engaging discussions, it's really cool to to actually learn from each other but i agree that you have to have that culture that it's okay to discuss and disagree as well mm -hmm. we don't always agree and that's fine you know because each of us has their own opinion and then there's a manager who says okay but we do it like that or that if we yeah. cannot find a consent that's why you have a manager that he yeah. can take the decision if there is no consent in the team but uh, I think we really all benefit from it. So that's that's cool. That's cool that you can see some benefit already because I I don't. Yeah, like I said, I can definitely relate if this is um, difficult for some teams. Um, I think where I cannot relate anymore when I when I tend to get angry <laughs> and, and frustrated is when people um, don't change the situation like you can have one or two or a couple of situations when you cannot include somebody um, because it wouldn't be a fit but at some point you will have to realize okay maybe we need to change a little bit more and like you cannot because i this not this doesn't go for gender diversity but for diverse backgrounds for example in coding because this is our main topic in up level because we are training job switchers to become web developers so our um our uh, uh, bootcamp participants are usually dance instructors, ex-flight uh, attendants, these kind of people, or people who come have a, an academic background but, but in a totally different field, you know. And these people are now becoming web developers. Now we're going to the companies and we're 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 talking about these um, these people being really good fits, and then. I can totally relate if the companies are like, well, this doesn't really fit at the moment. We don't have the setup. We don't have the structure to onboard these people now because it would take a little bit more of mentoring, of handholding maybe in the beginning. That's that's fine. But I want to see some progress, you know? Then I want to see some progress. I want to see, okay, what can we do to, to improve this? How can we, uh, what, what, what can we implement to, um, uh, to have a better setup next time? Because what, what then happens is that everybody's complaining that there's not enough developers and that we have such a lack of skill workforce on the market. And I'm like, well, the skill is here. You need to take a risk at some point. And, um, and if it doesn't fit now, then make it fit tomorrow and and that's um yeah so i i just 
I'm, I'm patient with everybody as long as I see com uh, see a conversation going on and yeah. some progress. <laughs> um, all right. Wow. All right. I don't want to take this too long. Uh, as I said, uh, we can definitely talk um, uh, offline. Uh, yes, please feel free to keep the conversation going also in our LinkedIn group because that's actually the reason why we created it exactly for sharing such ideas, examples, because many times, um, even with all the things that you said, all the situations with the reception and so on, mm -hmm. that people think that you're the receptionist. I think if we are more open and sharing it more openly, be it in a private LinkedIn group so that it's mm -hmm. not completely open, but I think we can really encourage each other that Everyone has those days and um, the situations happening, but it's okay and you're not alone and we can share it. Um, or also about imposter syndrome that you mentioned. Yeah. I talked to a friend only recently and and some she said something about she got a compliment from a customer. And obviously she said, yeah, but it was my team as well, blah, blah, blah. So yeah. I said, why did you, but anyhow. Um, and then she said, but I don't feel that that I deserved it, you know, like and um, because well, I'm, I'm just a junior consultant. I'm not even a senior consultant and so on. Yeah. So it was like, and that, then I told her, you know, but I mean, I, I feel that too sometimes that oh. why am I even that in that role? I mean, I am not sure that everyone tells me that I'm doing a good job, but maybe they actually don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, it's so stupid and I think everyone has those days yeah. or situations where you feel like, I don't think I should be there. And if we share it more openly, I think people would feel more confident to say, okay, I can realize that this is now a situation where I feel I don't, um, sh I shouldn't be there, mm -hmm. but I know it's just a feeling and tomorrow it will be um, good again, you know? And I think already that if you can just be aware that you're now feeling that you shouldn't be there, you're already much further than if you're thinking you're not good enough. Yeah, good point. I have good articles on that. I feel like I need to contribute to the LinkedIn group more. I will share. I will share some some links tomorrow. <laughs> let me know. Let me know how to how to share this with you. Um, and um, like Astrid and Louis, and I will I will uh, send you the the resources and so on. And everyone else can obviously also reach out to me directly. But apart from that, I guess you will have a like a recording or something, and 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 also share this. Yeah. Nice. Perfect. It was really nice having every one of you. We really enjoyed Thank it. Thank you so much for the interesting discussion. Yes, and it for was everyone great for me to participate. I really loved it. it. I think it was never virtually so interactive like today, to be honest. Cool. Yeah. That's, 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 <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> an awesome, awesome perfect, uh, um, the perfect uh, uh, thing for me to hear. Oh, love it. <laughs> no, I like right, girls. It's really good to set this up. <laughs> so, so that's a good feedback from, for, like, from my side. That's the feedback for to future speakers. It, this is a topic that I'm talking about almost on a daily basis, but I never did any slides out of it. It's good to have this process of, um, kind of, getting your thoughts in a more structured way, on, on, so that others can benefit from it. That's that's actually a very good process. I've never done it before. That's, that's very cool. Cool, cool. Very, very nice. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank All right. You. All right. Okay. Have a great Thank you. Bye. Everybody. Thank you for joining. Bye. Eva, you have a very patient dog. Great evening. <laughs> Bye. Okay.